I want to start just with some introductions. Many of you I've had a chance to meet, but many I have not yet. Uh, my name is Mac Cummins. I'm the new Chief Executive Officer here at the Reston Association. Um, I've been here for about six months and couldn't be happier about the community. Um, my wife and I and our daughter absolutely love living here. Um, so hopefully if I see you out and about on a trail, which I spend quite a bit of time down in the south part of the community, uh, running on the trails down there during the daytime. So if we get to the warmer season, I'm sure I'll see you around. Um, I want to start with some introductions and then we'll talk about uh, all the good stuff we're going to talk about regarding the project tonight. I want to start with introductions um, of our board members and our department directors. So um, <clears throat> in no particular order, we've got Bob Petrine, Jennifer Jeshek, Erwin Flashman, John Farrell, I think I saw Margaret Perry, I'm not sure where she said it, Margaret Perry. I think nobody else snuck in, right? Okay. Um, for key staff tonight, uh, helping us out, Larry Butler, our Chief Operating Officer. He thinks he's retiring, but we didn't quite <laughs> accept that, so um, we've got him for a few more months anyways. Um, Chris Schumacher, our Director of Capital Projects and Laura Kowalski, our Director of Recreation. So I'm gonna do just a very quick kickoff um, and talk about the agenda for this evening, and I'm gonna hand it off to Chris. Our main objective tonight is to walk everyone in the community through uh, the project itself as proposed out at Barton Hills, take input, feedback from you all, answer questions that you may have, talk about the process going forward, where key decision points are going to be made and where you can weigh in um, in the future as well, and, and then really the project itself and what's happening next. So what we're gonna try to do is give you some information and the scope of work and then open up the floor for you all and we'll all be here to help you um, through your questions and answers and or take copious notes of feedback. We're also videotaping in the back for those of you that are familiar with that process. We typically use those tapes and post them to YouTube afterwards. So for those of you that may be new, um, that's of course gonna happen as well. So at any rate, why don't I hand it off to Chris here and we'll start talking about the project and, and get this rolling. Good evening. I um, also want to do a couple other quick introductions. So I've got uh, Austin Mayhew and Jay Schmitz. They're both on our capital projects department. I also have our engineers from Kinley Horn, Sean and Evan. All right, so. So first up we're gonna talk about is the history of the project. So uh, back in 2021, uh, the staff, as well as the support from PRAC, presented Barton Hill Project to the Board of Directors. At that point in time, we had presented options that included um, putting in a permanent cover over top of the courts, installing permanent pickleball, as well as the court lighting. Now, the cover was not actually a new idea. This was actually presented way back in, I think it was 2000 originally. It was a joint venture with another organization. But that idea was scrubbed. After we started looking into the details of that element, the board decided it wasn't really, you know, in current we needed, the budget was gonna to be too high for it, so the cover option was deleted from scope of work. However, the lighting and the pickleball were continued on within the project scope. So in the 2022 capital budget, the installation of court lighting and permanent pickleball was put in, into there. Um, as part of that process, we have to go through Fairfax County for a determination on the lighting installation. So through that process, we had a determination from Fairfax County that said that a PRC plan or a planned residential community plan amendment would be required in order to install those lights. So we got that determination back, we did an appeal that was reaffirmed, and then at the end of last year, Board of the Directors removed the lighting from the scope of work, but maintained pickleball in scope. So as part of the 2023 capital budget, we have a combined budget of just over $770,000 for the work. So an update on court conditions. So these, this court was built in 1985, right around the same time as the development of Rested Barton Hill area. Um, so we do crack repairs, which are kind of our standard maintenance practice on a seven year cycle for a typical tennis facility. And then we do recappings, or just an overlay of asphalt every 21, and a full rebuild at, every, at 42. So in 2011, and then again in 2017, we did crack repairs and color codes. But in 2021, we started seeing more cracks appearing. You can see in that 
two side images. The bottom image is in 2017, right after we finished the color coding crack repair. And then by April of 2021, we were seeing that throughout the court. So we obviously, there's something going on beneath this facility that we need to investigate because something is structural related. So we did, a, we did a geotechnical study of the course and we got back samples and studies as to the results of it. And what we discovered is that we have a condition called um, expansive soils beneath the core. And that's causing what's called reflective cracking. So expansive soils I like to kind of describe as like a sponge. As the sponge dries out, it contracts. And as it gets wet, it expands. And so if you have any kind of cracks or perforations through that quartz surface, water gets to it, it starts impacting that soil, causing it to go in and out as it wets and dries. Then you have a compound with thermal expansion during the summer and winter of heat, cold, heat, cold. So as you're constantly have all that movement beneath the court, you start creating cracks and they start developing up through the surface of the asphalt. And so no matter what, you can keep repairing cracks, they'll keep showing up. You can keep throwing layers of asphalt over top of it and they'll actually reflect through. Kind of like Princess and the Pea, the old kid story. You can still feel it all the way through the different layers of the mattress. So it's a similar thing with the, with the asphalt. So you kind of see sort of a description of how that works with sub-base, which is your soils, working through one layer of asphalt and kind of keeping, you know, going up from there. So what you end up doing is dealing with a constant cycle of repairs as you repair cracks in previous layers in the next layer. So what do you have to do to fix this problem? Well, we figured this, we did a kind of an experiment, I would say, but it's actually a pretty um, well-established one over at Hook Road a couple years ago where it also had similar problems with reflective cracking. And so there's really two ways to deal with a poor sub-base situation. You can either eliminate the problem by undercutting the court, digging up all the soil to get rid of that, and then put in new sub-base and build on top. Very expensive, very disruptive, because you have to now haul out all of that material. That's thousands of square yards, potentially. Or you could bridge the problem. So we did this at Hook Road by a process called full depth reclamation. And this is not really a new technology. They've been doing it since the 1960s on highways. And it's a process where you take a piece of machinery, it's specialized, called a full depth reclamator. You can see in that bottom right image there, that big tank looking thing. What that does is it grinds up the cord asphalt and just pulverizes it down to a fine aggregate. Then you take Portland cement and you lay it over the cord in a powder. Then the machine comes back around and with a water tanker hooked to the front of it, you see that image, it sprays water as it mixes the aggregate and the cement together, and then you have compaction rollers that come by and then compresses it. And so you create what's called cementitious aggregate, or CTA. And this creates kind of like a concrete sub-base that you can then build on top of. Beyond that, we're also adding geotechnical fabrics. So these, what I like to equate to is rebar for asphalt. And it creates additional structural support for the asphalt above it, to then help with any kind of strains or pulls or depressions that you may find in the court surface. So we have multiple layers of that between the base and then actually in between the different court layers of asphalt. So as this process, we don't have any, um, to, any spoils to get rid of. You recycle everything on site, so there's nothing getting thrown into a landfill. It's cost effective and it's fast, much faster than trying to undercut a court. Um, but as a result, well, there'll be a slight increase in the height of the court between 12 and 16 inches because you're still building up on top of the existing surface. You're not taking anything out, so you're still going to be building up. And to address that height increase, we actually build a concrete reinforced curb all around the facility to not only support the edges and dress it, that's also where the new fencing goes for the court. So we then put fencing all around it to then kind of help you know, create one nice continuous uh, facility. So. Here's the next part of the project beyond just the court repairs. And this gets into the pickleball piece. So the scope of work has the installation of six pickleball courts on the east battery. Now the reason why we have six here versus four like we have over bottom is because of footprint. We have more areas, so we're optimizing the space we have available. We also don't have light poles interfering with the court position, so we can actually place them in the center as well. Um, so, and then the western battery of courts would remain tennis courts, but with blended lines that would then allow hybrid use for pickleball on, you know, occasions to allow flexibility for usage. Then there'll also be divider fences and curtains installed on the pickleball side, then create court separations between different playing areas. And we'll do some gate modifications as well for access in and out within the court. So you can see here in the image, you know, those are the court um, surfaces on that side. And then we also provided some measurement distances from fence line to property lines. You can kind of get an idea of 
where we are in proximity to the other um, residences in the neighborhood, and I'll kind of touch on that a little bit later in another slide. So beyond just the pickleball, we're also going to do some other enhancements around the facility. So as part of the project, we have to construct a, a construction entrance to get to it. It's kind of isolated from the parking lot, so we actually have to create a temporary bridge over top of a culvert to then get the heavy machinery in there. It's temporary, and we'll pull that out and then re-landscape it after we complete the work. We'll also be doing some drainage repairs. So in that back right corner, kind of as the two courts sort of offset from each other, there's a bit of a low area that's always had standing water and erosion problems. So we're going to address that issue as well. And then we'll do some tree pronings around the perimeter of the court in order to help alleviate a lot of the tree droppings and algae that's formed because that presents not only standing and damage to the court, but also creates a uh, slip hazard for users as well. So that's the, the primary scope of the project. Now in this portion, I kind of get into the project life cycle for this. So the project was first initiated, like I said, in 2021, when we first brought up. 2022, we had a budget approval and now we're still in the planning and scoping phase. You can see that red line right there. That's, pro that's right where we are right now. In between these different phases of design architecture and estimation and implementation, you have these key decision points. So these are stop points that we check in with the board of directors before we then move into the next phase. So we'll be looking to get key decision point number one approved once we have the you know, scope of work um, finalized and then presented back to the board. And we'll be moving into that point with the design review board approvals which will then touch point at KDP, KDP 2. And then at 3, we'll be actually presenting a contract for approval for then construction to begin after that. So this is the approximate timeline right now that we're looking at. And as we get further into the process, we'll be able to refine it a bit further. So getting into some of the details regarding the impacts of the project. And first off is the court noise that I know is a major concern with this project. So what we actually did is a preemptive measure to kind of see what are we dealing with from a, from a data standpoint. So we did a sound study um, earlier this month over at Ottawa Pickleball and Tennis. And we did multiple readings and you know, if there's any technical questions, we'll get to the Q&A. I have my engineering team with Kimley Horn. They're a little bit more apt at this type of thing than I am. Um, I'm more into construction, not the, the background sound sciences per se. Um, but from that study, we did, we're able to extrapolate a couple different things. Um, so from that study, we had a total of nine different microphones, and these are lab calibrated, I think they're like $10,000, very expensive precision equipment that took these sound readings. Um, we had a total of nine different points where sound was taken. One was a constant, which ran for a, two, a full two-hour period, and then we had um, short-term sound monitoring systems that took five-minute recordings. They recorded all the different sound levels that were occurring around that facility. So we took these readings. Um, between 4 and 6 p.m., which is kind of the, the peak usage hours over there this time of year. And all the courts were filled with um, both the pickleball permanent and the hybrid, and there's also a waiting list that was kind of there. So it was a pretty busy day. Um, so they took readings for a two-hour period, and they came up with a couple of different details. First off was the um, sustained sound levels never breached 60 dBA at 150 feet and never breached 100 dBA of uh, impulse sound. So Fairfax County delineates their code ordinance by um, sustained and impulse sounds. And they have different limitations that you can have depending on the type of sound. Impulse is like one second, and then it has a pause in another second. And continuous is just like a droning hum that you might have from roadway. Um, so those sound levels have like, restrictions depending on the time of day and limitations therefore. Um, however, there's also a detail within the ordinance that actually excludes recreational grounds from these type of ordinances but we are still very cognizant of the sound being produced on this facility. And in that image to the side, we kind of get a feel of where these limits lie. So a 60 dBA is about the hum of an air conditioner versus 100 dBA, which is a garbage truck backing maybe in and out of your driveway. So it kind of gives you a feel of what those levels really mean. Some other impacts related to the project that we wanted to address were parking and access. So um, the current facility has a nine uh, parking bay with an ADA and then the opposite side that is also with the soccer fields and other 19 spaces. So a total of 28 spaces. Um, what we would try to do is we'd ensure that we wouldn't try to schedule both pickleball events and soccer field events simultaneously because that could create a problem. So we'd definitely be working to stagger any of those type of elements to prevent that kind of issue from occurring. Um, we'd also be doing some 
uh, landscape screening can be installed in areas that were disturbed by construction so we can work on you know, doing some landscaping plans around right to soften the area or try to block any visuals as well. Um, and then we'll be, you know, but the problem is modifications to the roadways that's owned by VDOT is outside of our ability to do without their approval. So currently in the scope of work, we're not including any kind of roadway changes in terms of access, signage, or striping because that would have to be cleared by VDOT to do so. So I'm going to hand this over to Laura to talk about the programming we're going to do there. Good evening, everyone. It's nice to see everyone out here. I haven't seen many of you in person for quite some time. Um, so if any of you play pickleball or tennis or uh, both, um, you're likely to know Rob Tucker, um, our pickleball and tennis manager. He's in the back if you have any questions. And then also Dan Marinick is our senior program manager here this evening as well. So I'm going to talk about um, open play and programming. So open play is just a, a pickup game or an organized group of people coming out to play the courts on their own without a, a scheduled time, unlike a, a lesson. So uh, for open play, the hours of operation for both tennis and pickleball are 7 a.m. Uh, to sundown, would be sundown at this facility with, with no lights there. Um, and those restrictions for that 7 a.m. Are, are dictated by Fairfax County Noise Ordinance. Um, and then open play is also just weather, weather permitting. So that could be year round. Um, and again, weather permitting. If it's a nice day like this in March or even some of those good days in February, our other courts are open uh, year round for, for play. Um, and then we move to programming. So our programming would be um, April through November. And um, that's where we have for tennis. We would have a tennis instruction for um, both adults and junior lessons. <laughs> Um, rentals, um, some small rentals, USTA, and then also a couple of schools. And then for pickleball, um, same thing, adult and junior group and, and private instructions available. Um, there's a potential that um, we could bring league play to Reston with an additional site. Um, no decisions have been made about that. It's just something with pickleball being so popular. There are leagues that are available in other areas, and that's something that we could explore. Um, and then social events for both pickleball and tennis. And then um, we, we do host uh, tournaments at for pickleball um, for the last two years. We've um, tried our hand at that, at the Autumnwood facility and Lake Newport facility. So this would be an opportunity for, uh, for that type of activity at Barton Hill as well. Thank you. Chris. So, um, now we want to open opportunity for anyone to ask some questions. Uh, we'll probably provide answers as best we can. If we can't answer, we'll make sure we get back to you guys. Uh, we're also opportunities for comments. So I just want to kind of lay down some ground rules for everyone. Um, so you know, please state your name so we can record that as well. So we can also follow up with you if they're happy to have an answer, um, you know, have a question answered later. This is a public input session, not a debate. Um, follow up questions are answered after the first question. So once you answer, everyone goes around, then you can have a second question. Um, comments are, related, are limited to three minutes. Uh, everyone is encouraged to participate. So if you don't feel like sitting up an M and giving your question, you know, write down an index card. We have some in the back of the room. We have some over there. You can just hand them to staff in the back, and we'll make sure we bring them up and have them read. We'll also have someone walking around with a microphone uh, to make sure that everyone can hear you for your questions. Um, please, one person speak at a time. Uh, Listen and respect other points of view. Do your best to understand the pros and cons of every option, not just the ones you prefer. Seek first to understand, not to be understood. And, uh, and as I said, you know, write down a question on the index card if you don't feel comfortable uh, standing up for it. So with that, we will open the floor. Everybody wants to use the mic and walk around. That's what we're debating over here in the court. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, I'm a, a resident and a avid uh, player of tennis and pickleball. And I, I want to compliment Laura and Rob. Uh, they Name are ter terrific. Name and address? Uh, Terrence McCarthy, and I'm uh, 11464 Lynx Drive. Thank you. Um, I guess three things. One, as a player, um, it cannot be understated how critical it is for the surface not to have dead spots. This is really just destroys the game. And um, 
I know Hook, uh, you know, has been revamped, and uh, but the one issue that I found with Hook is it doesn't dry like the rest of the uh, courts. It, it, it retains the, uh, the the water on the surface a lot longer than it used to, and maybe that's just something we'll have to deal with because of the new, you know, you you uh, use that new process to get rid of the cracks, um, and then. One thing I would request uh, or, or just mention is that, uh, and this has been discussed amongst the community, is that most of the um, most of the uh, public pickleball courts have uh, areas where you can put your your racket. It's so popular and it's such a great game. I mean, you have 100 people out there on uh, eight courts. And uh, so you have to line up, you have to queue up. And one thing that would be nice, especially at Barton Hills, if you're putting up a new fence, is incorporate a little, it's, it's very simple, you just put uh, poles where you can put your racket and then everybody queues up. All right, that's more than three minutes. I, I do appreciate uh, the recreation center in, the, in Ruston and we need to keep the golf courses. Okay. <laughs> I'm Hayes McCarty. I live at 1942 Upper Lake Drive, and I'm an avid pickleball player as well as a tennis player for, for many years in wrestling. Um, I like the program that you've uh, laid out, and I, I totally support it. The question I didn't quite understand when you um, showed the, the timeline is when do you really anticipate construction starting and when do you anticipate completion of this complex? So uh, there's a couple different, like I said, key decision points we have to get through first. And so um, Alex shall have talked about that uh, after this. I might have probably should have moved it up a little earlier. But um, we're hoping to get the first key decision point cleared in May. Um, there's unfortunately no board meeting really held in April because of the elections. Mm -hmm. uh, so once we get past that point, we can kind of start getting a better idea of timeline to start construction. Um, I would hope that sometime around July, we might start, and then it's going to be between you know five and six months, hopefully shorter, to actually get through construction to completion. Um, but I'll also mention later, uh, it, it's dependent on contractor availability and weather. Okay. Um, that may dictate you know schedule a little bit. And what's the key decision point in July? Or in, July? in July would be the contract approval is okay. the one. Probably by that point, we'd be looking to get cleared to then start. Okay. All right, thank you. My name is Laura David and I live at 10964 Harper Square Court. We are the cluster of townhomes you will see on the back side of the Barton Hill Tennis Courts. And so although we understand that pickleball is popular, this is the first time we've been introduced to the idea that there would be six permanent pickleball courts, which at capacity would be 24 players, but if 24 more are waiting for a tournament start time or coming into that area to play next would be 48. And as this gentleman said, often with the wonderful enthusiasm of pickleball players, there are many other people around cheering, shouting, and making noise. So everything I read from USAA Pickleball, your governing association, says that the court itself generates about 70 decibels, and that 70 decibels without soundproof equipment will linger 100 yards or 100 feet farther where we have a natural habitat ravine and wildlife and nesting birds and 100 feet further is actually the property line for most of the properties in our community. 70 decibels is eight times the noise of 40 decibels which is the ambient uh, sound in our neighborhood. If you take 48 pickleball players playing or waiting to play and other mixed use, there's no way parking and traffic will be safe for our kids on bikes, for our people walking dogs, and for the general appreciation of a Sunday morning, 7 a.m. quiet cup of coffee on the deck of our back of our properties. So we would really like to see in the budget and in the plan some sound absorbing netting or equipment or curtains. USAA Pickleball soundly soundly recommends that in communities you automatically install the sound absorbing not only for the sake of the residents but the pickleball players because the pickleball suffer progressive 
hearing loss and hearing impairment from the constant sound and the, it's not impulse, it's constant, moment after moment after moment after moment because of the plastic and the hard equipment. So we would like to see in the budget some um, budgeting for uh, soundproof curtains and for future curtains to be applied as we analyze transparently the actual use of this facility and its impact on noise and transportation in the community. I live at 2405 Myrtle Lane and I am also an avid tennis and pickleball player. Um, I know that Mike Branlin was also supposed to be here. Unfortunately, he had a conflict and I know that he sent an email to be read. It's going to be longer than three minutes, so I won't read it. Um, but I, what, I, um, what I want to say is um, Autumnwood is a great facility. Um, we have a great community there. Uh, Reston has a ton of tennis courts, so many. If you drive around, you won't see a lot of people on the tennis courts, but there's a lot of players on the pickleball courts. With Barton Hill on the other side of Reston being pickleball, um, that will actually help the community. Um, I don't know that you'll have 100 people at both sites because we'll have two active, um, one on the north side, one on the south side. Um, our question is also, uh, would it be able to have um, Barton Hill be purely pickleball, no tennis? We have a lot of tennis courts in Reston, so if we had two anchors at Autumnwood and at Barton Hill for pickleball, um, I think that would be a great way to just keep pickleball in two spots and then have the tennis players have all the other courts that are around Reston. Um, so as, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we are looking to put the blended lines within the uh, permanent tennis courts we have over there, the existing ones, to then allow the flexibility for that. Uh, we did evaluate options if we did the whole thing pickleball, but we felt that it would be a little bit, you know, we wanted to be, try to strike a balance between the pickleball players and the tennis players still, and without the lighting, it kind of drove the idea further to kind of just maintain an equal balance um, at this facility. So, you know, at the current scope, we're not looking at doing a full both sides conversion, but we are at least looking at doing a hybrid to expand it a bit beyond that as needed. Um, so we have a hybrid at Autumnwood as well, and I can tell you that most people, and I, I know there's a lot of pickleball players here, prefer the pure pickleball courts. The hybrids are tough um, with the surfaces, and I, I can't tell you um, the last time a tennis player actually came over and played it on wood. It's been zilch. Um, and because there's so many places to play. I live near Barton Hill and you know, play, there's so many other courts in that area to play tennis. So I'd ask you to consider looking at it being a pure pickleball as well as on wood eventually as well. Hi, I'm Izzy Santa. I live at 1932 Barton Hill Road. And great presentation. I commend you guys for trying to do the best to explain this to all of us. I know it takes a village, but from my perspective, I feel that what I find disappointing is that you kind of drop the fact that you're not going to do anything because it's V dot. And that crossroad, Emma Walker, I take my kid to Sunrise Valley that intersection and so many people turning because there is a blind spot causes so many accidents every year at least there's one major one and i don't understand why you couldn't present a more meaningful plan that addresses the fact that with more foot traffic there is an increase in vulnerability vulnerability for road users like pedestrians and cyclists and then my second question is, and I hope you can answer it, is like, what are the current statistics for foot traffic based on the current setup that you have 
and then explain to us what the impact of that foot traffic is going to be on Barton Hill Road, along with the trash that's going to come with it. So in, in regards to the V dot element, we can definitely try to pursue them to make some impacts, but I can't just start marking things and putting up signs. That's within V dot's right of way. I can't touch it. Actually, could be fine if I even tried. I know there's been ongoing attempts. I believe you know Mr. Roundtree's out there now. He's been attempting to try to go after V dot for a long time on trying to address some of the intersection concerns over there. Um, it's something we could definitely try to you know push on them. But because it's VDOT, they do kind of have the final say on whether or not they would do it. Um, but you know, understood with some we can we can try to look into. But I can't necessarily promise that we can get any results from that. Um, in terms of the current foot traffic over there, we don't really have the ability to track that element really right now. Uh, we don't have people checking in at the, at the current time to kind of track who's coming and going on foot or vehicle. We know that it's likely predominantly by vehicle uh, currently at that facility um, or by bike. Um, but you know, beyond that, I'm not terribly uh, familiar with it. Lori, do you have any details on that by chance? No. So we have, um, the only thing that we can really do is take a look at some of the other facilities. But as you saw, the court conditions there, we know that the, the usage has dropped down significantly for tennis play. <clears throat> Excuse me, for tennis play because of, because of those court conditions. Um, if you, going back to the, the slide that had the, the pickleball courts, um, the six courts, and then also the, the two tennis courts, um, so it's about 32 players at, at one time max if everyone was playing doubles. And then, um, and then you would have um, additional spectators there. And, um, and Chris had mentioned that there really needs to be some kind of, um, you know, there needs to be a schedule and there will be coordination amongst our team knowing when uh, soccer would be there and when, um, when the pickleball use and, and tennis use. The programming, we certainly know those numbers. We would be programming those facilities during that time. It's a walk-in and open play that we don't have a, a, a big, a good pulse on. Thank you. I just want to make this perfectly clear. I understand that you yourselves can't do anything about this unilaterally. However, what I am saying is you are a wrestling association. You came up with this plan, so it is um, on you to be an advocate for us walkers and everybody on that street because there are accidents to be sort of the advocates and lobbyists to help Walter and Melanie and everybody else to fix that crossroad because it's going to become an issue. Uh, thank you. My name is Terry Ponick, P O N I C K, 10912 Harper Square Court. Uh, my house unfortunately backs onto what's, what's being proposed. Uh, actually, uh, by sort of like the second year issue uh, about the, uh, the traffic, the sight lines, and that sort of thing. One thing I didn't see particularly highlighted uh, is, is what, what's to be done about the parking and traffic situation. Uh, a lot of times, particularly when there are soccer games going on, uh, you not only have both lots full of cars, but you have cars up the berm on one side and down the berm on the other side, up to and sometimes even past the uh, townhouse developments. Uh, I suppose the berm is probably VDOT territory, et cetera, et cetera, but this creates an extra dangerous situation uh, in so far as pedestrian traffic and auto traffic is concerned. Uh, people come dashing in through the parked cars uh, without warning, and uh, I've seen, seen some near misses, and I've seen a couple of ambulances show up also. Uh, there's a very serious potential problem with traffic when you consider all the people that, it seems the pickleball people, seem to expect to show up uh, to take advantage of these new courts, and that's just going to exacerbate the problem that you uh, brought up. And uh, whether it's VDOT or Rustin Association or whatever, I think you know, parking and placement of vehicles uh, and overall usage is going to be a very serious issue, and I think it needs to be looked into a lot more carefully than the plan uh, would seem to indicate. Oh, 
Hi, I'm Tom Johnston. I live at 10939 Harper Square Court in the cluster behind the tennis courts. I'm nervous. <laughs> um, I want to point out one thing that I've, I've not heard before in either this one or the previous tennis bubble problem that we had years ago where they tried to put in lights and a big cover and expand the tennis courts, yada, yada, yada. And we managed to, to stop that. Um, if you look at a map of the area, it seems like the perfect place for uh, some sort of expansion like this. It's, it's on the edge between business community on one side of the, of the main road and um, uh, denser than single family, denser housing on the other. And there's already athletic facilities there. So, you know, it, there should be a problem with more traffic or a little more noise or yada, yada, yada. It's already that kind of neighborhood. But if you go there and stand at that intersection and look at the tennis courts and look around, you don't see any of that. The businesses are on top of a hill on the other side of the highway. They're hidden by pine trees. You hardly know they're there. They don't make any noise. The, the neighborhood is pastoral. It's quiet. It's what you move to Reston for. Good living, raise a family, etc. So I, I want the designers and planners to be aware of that when they're thinking about they're not just looking at a plan. Um, you need to go there and look at the site and listen. Um, which brings up, um, I did not see any sound measurements taken at the site now. I saw some sound measurements of pickleball and how it's below certain levels, yada, yada, yada. But what we're used to now is we can hear traffic noise and we can hear uh, other things, and we hear the the slow thump thump of tennis balls, and that's not too bad. So, from I'd like to see measurement of how that's going to change. I understand that pickleball is a little faster, a little noisier, and now I'm hearing that you expect people standing in line and good time and these are all good things but um, without any sound protection how is the neighborhood going to change are you going to change the neighborhood of 50 townhomes on one side and and the other side of the street uh, I don't know how many are over there are you going to change that from idyllic family rearing pastoral neighborhood to mm, busy, lots of parked cars all day long up and down the street, um, uh, kind of noisy, kind of like living on the edge of a commercial area, which right now it, it isn't. So I'd like to see some actual measurements of that and, and how you think that's going to change. Um, I like to hear that USAA Pickleball that they recommend sound reduction, that you always should have sound reduction, even for the players. Um, uh, are we not able to afford a less invasive location that changes people's lives who live there? So, one other thing. Um, about the accident problem, I can help with some information about the accident problem at that intersection. The, I have seen, I, I myself witnessed one of the accidents, and I have seen the aftermath and, and heard about and talked about other couple of accidents, a couple of which were just really terrible. And there's a very specific problem there. In the spring and the fall, when the sun is just right, it shines straight down the hill of Sunrise Valley. So if you're coming from one direction, going west, you're blinded and you can't see a bicycle uh, especially or anything like that coming down the other side. 
So if you go to turn left, you turn right into somebody. And I know at least two of those accidents, and the worst accident, where they even brought out a helicopter, was those conditions. So I hope that helps in your thinking about what maybe even simple signage, warning about the sun or something. So anyway, so um, please look into and let us know how you think this might change the environment of the neighborhood. Hi, I'm Rob Richardson, 11839 Shire Court in South Preston. And I'm a tennis player and now a pickleball player. I took the intro to pickleball class almost two years ago. And I know Reston is cranking out pickleball players thanks to the popularity of their intro classes. And a lot of tennis players are switching. I actually prefer pickleball now after playing it and I used to play tennis. So I, I would like as Patty said, to see dedicated pickleball courts, more than six even. And I think 48 people at 7 a.m. is a little unrealistic from my experience a lot. I mean, you're lucky to get four people at 8 or 9 a.m. on weekends and I don't know about the weekdays. So peak hours, yes. And the evenings, 4 to 6 p.m., maybe even afternoons on these days, you're going to get a lot of people. But at you know, 7, 8 a.m., it's not going to be 48 people if there's dedicated courts. I mean, that's crazy. So I, I would like to see dedicated pickleball courts in South Reston and even de all dedicated pickleball courts at Autumnwood because there are a lot of tennis courts. And of course, no one wants pickleball in their backyard. I understand that. And I might be opposed if it was in my backyard. But I mean, where else really is there in Reston without housing? So that, that's my thoughts, and uh, I'd like to see more dedication. I'm thinking what the better place to have a pickleball facility would be um, um, North Point. If you have plenty of parking, you don't have people around, you have a bathroom, you're away from other um, businesses, so that would make more sense to have so many people at one time. Uh, Mark Sendich, 2419, Play Banquet. Uh, the only kind of question comment I had was more regarding the, the lights. I guess I wasn't clear on what you said Fairfax County just won't allow it. Do you kind of elaborate that a little bit? And then kind of the follow on to it was, is there any provisions for adding conduit, adding future light additions if Fairfax County allowed it in the future without you know great remodeling costs on you guys? You know, put in the small costs now to make it easier in the future um so as part of the process we had to get the prc planning amendments uh with fairfax county that was their determination um, that was also appealed to the bza the board of zoning appeals and they reaffirmed that decision so at that point i guess it would be to the circuit court i believe yeah. I mean, I more, outside that. more closely so it's not that the county said lights aren't allowed they just identified the process by which RA would have to apply to the county. Um, the board decided, the community decided at that time we would not pursue lights. So in sequence, um, it's RA that's deciding not to do lights out there. So they're no longer scoped in the project. And never would be in the future potentially either, is what you're saying. Not, not part of this construction project going forward? Renee Scheidt, 
1339 Park Garden Lane. Um, so a couple of comments have um, mentioned other facilities. Um, so North Hills is the North Point Courts, and those are clay and recently redone. And when the pool is busy, it's not exactly an easy place to park. Um, and I follow the rise, I'm a tennis player, and I follow the rise of pickleball because I find it fascinating. Um, and I've played it three times and I don't enjoy it. But um, so it's just, it's interesting to me some of the finer points of it. And um, so like Vienna, when, you know, they had a town council meeting on how many hours and how many days a week they were going to allow their courts to be used for pickleball, like that kind of stuff is fascinating. So um, when Autumnwood is not being, well, it may not be used by tennis players and therefore they're off somewhere else. It's not necessarily by choice. Um, I'm a league tennis player in Reston, so I do go to Autumnwood, and it is not by choice. Um, it, it, pickleball is loud and rather relatively disruptive to a tennis player, and I felt bad because it was at North, um, sorry, it's at Lake Newport last week, and somebody was playing tennis right next to a pickleball player. And so some of what um, I've seen in terms of the pickleball tennis battle is that it can get nasty and contested, but I've also seen that when um, the courts change on the hour and people don't understand the rules and regulations and it's just you versus them in terms of you have to leave the court now. So I was wondering if and what recourse and process improvements we could do in terms of what reservation system we were going to use. <coughs> Autumnwood right now doesn't really have that great of a system. I know there's a post on the um, tennis court that says tennis has priority on like certain days maybe or just there's something about the tennis priority um, and I don't necessarily take great joy in kicking a pickleball player off but you know that's something that uh, that will happen and with more hybrid opportunities I think that that could be something that we see more of and I don't think that we're going to get physical about it but it's obviously something that people feel passionately about so um, I just was wondering or was looking for um, the situation that you know we could be more kumbaya thank you I'm gonna bring that down to Rob <laughs> So I appreciate the, the points that you made, and I just I took a bunch of notes. And we don't currently have a reservation system um, for individuals to, to join, to, to reserve a court and come play. It's open play, first come, first serve, right now throughout the community. Um, we've looked into various reservation systems um, before, and um, we do not have staff that are on site for enforcement. Um, so with Automotive Pickleball, we actually do have a court monitor that, that is there. Um, to help to make sure that there are pass holders that are using it. It's not people coming from outside the community that aren't authorized to be there. So that the people, so that you all that are here that play um, can enjoy that um, and not have um, outsiders coming in. Rob, is there anything else you'd like to add? Oh yeah, I want to thank both groups because I know most of the people in this room for coming out. Um, we, I heard someone bring up, a few people bring up USA Pickleball. Well, USTA is, is a big part of this as well. And USDA firmly believes that pickleball players should be able to go and play pickleball and not run into tennis players, and that's their home, and tennis players should be able to do the same thing. The blended line situation, the Autumnwood situation, everyone, if you don't know, Autumnwood has some of the nicest lights in Northern Virginia. Tennis players are dying to get on those courts. And if Fairfax County is going to put a stop to us growing lighted courts, and that makes auto with tennis lights even more important to tennis players. I think tennis players have been pretty fair, knowing that, and, and uh, quite a few people have mentioned here that I play tennis and pickleball, or I, I used to play tennis and I play pickleball. Um, I think the tennis players have been more than fair trying to stay away from auto wood while we try to figure out how to make pickleball grow. When we start getting into the tennis season and tennis leagues and tennis lessons, you will see a lot more tennis players showing up to Autumnwood, especially in the evening uh, for night play because with programming, open play, uh, leagues, there aren't, uh, 
I know it looks like a lot of tennis courts, but there's not a lot of lighted tennis courts when we start getting into the meat of our season. Um, so reservations are very different for pickleball than tennis. Pickleball is a very social um, games last 20 minutes. If you have a blended line tennis court, you could just take half a tennis court. Just four people are playing. So there is the situation where how do you monitor that? Um, USA Pickleball, USTA are both very firm believers that pickleball should have their site and tennis should have their site. And, that, and that's basically what we're trying to work through here. And in, some, in a lot of um, situations around the country, because this is what we do and this is what we study in my department, you're seeing two tennis courts go away and four pickleball courts being put next to two tennis courts. So that's, that's just kind of the hybrid situation um, that, that is happening. But the idea would be not to butcher tennis courts um, because, yes, we do have a lot of pickleball players. If you are coming down to play tennis at Autumnwood, you do not want to have a confrontation with 12, 16 pickleball players. They, they don't wish to have that. And that's another small part of the piece that people stay away from Autumnwood. But I promise you, come April when programming and leagues and lessons start, please welcome tennis players to Autumnwood because they'll be there. We're not tennis players at Autumnwood. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, that's. Rob Tucker is our tennis program manager, just in case no one got that up, obviously. My name is Rhonda Phillip. I live at 10902 Barton Hill Court. Um, my back of my house does line up, and I get to see the tennis courts right there. So I just wanted to re reiterate the concern about the noise. Um, I work from home. And uh, I know a lot of pickleball players are retired, and so they enjoy that time during the week. But I'm very concerned. I, I came to the meeting tonight and understand there were going to be, there was a proposal for four courts. Now I'm hearing six. And uh, I know there are also some neighbors here that work from home as well. I just am very concerned about the noise level, and I have not heard anything about any um, uh, measures that are going to be taken for noise abatement so it doesn't sound like that's in your plan you, it, for me it sounded like you were saying the noise level is acceptable but i'm very concerned about that and so i do hope that, that we're going to hear some more information about the steps you're going to take to control the noise thank you Catherine Caratore, 10960, Harper Square Court. Um, so, I, uh, same kind of topic on noise mitigation, but I'd actually like to phrase it as a question and see, like, is there any noise mitigation in the plan now, and could it be added? Currently, within the scope, there isn't. Um, however, there's always the evaluation phase of a project, so post-installation is something we would continue to monitor and, and investigate. Um, because of this, the information we currently have on hand, and Autumnwood was the, the facility we can actually test this at. It's, it's existing, it's in function right now, so we can actually take these readings. Trying to do that at Bart Hill, we could try to stage something, but it wouldn't be really realistic to what it would actually be in the end. Um, so from that data we have, we can try to extrapolate like the situation. The current level. You can measure the current level at Bart Hill. So the, the so we have ambient levels. It's 40 decibels. The, the ambient, 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 ambient noise right now while, while there's tennis players and yeah. so forth. Yeah, we see that. Yeah, so you compare it to your measurement of pickleball somewhere else in a similar manner. So you're saying that there would not be any noise mitigation until after the construction? and the evaluation period. Currently it's not within the scope, however with board directive that can be something that can be included within it, but in the, the existing scope of work that is not something that's included because based on the data we have at the time, um, it would really imply that there would be from a code compliance standpoint. Um, however, it is something that, you know, again, with direction and, and additional funding is something that can be looked at to be added to the scope. Okay, thanks.
Hi there, I'm Jackie Ruscha. I live at 1577 Regatta Lane. I do not back up to any, um, to Ottawa. However, I do love pickleball. My husband and I both, we play, we play regularly. Um, so first thing is, we have actually played on a court in California that did have sound abatement, like on the sides where there um, were actually houses and seemed to work out really, really well. So I, I, we had the experience of playing on a, an outdoor court like that where it seemed to work. Um, but my second point, when Rob was talking about people are typically not out on the courts at 7 o'clock a.m., that's true. So for whatever this is worth, um, in the summertime, we might come out in the morning, but you're not out there in the middle of the day. The people are at the pool. It's just way too hot. The, the temperature is way too hot. So the the amount of the number of people on the courts is um, related to weather. It's predicted upon what the weather is like. If it's wet outside, we're not on the court. We're not on the courts at all. If it's too hot, we're not on the courts. If it's too cold, we're not on the courts. So it's not like that all those courts are played. But there are that many people on the courts all the time from seven until six o'clock. However, like I said, I don't back up to pickleball court, so I, I completely respect and appreciate everyone else's feedback with that. And um, yeah, just to figure out there, if there's a way to, to um, get together on this, because it is very, very social. So many people in the community absolutely love it, and it's just, you know, it's a way to, to um, provide community for, for Reston. And like I said, it's not like it's 7 a.m. until 6 o'clock p.m. at night that they're, that they're like, there is a, a, a busy period when the weather is perfect from 4 to 6. So there is that. Before we circle back on the second question, anyone have a first question they haven't given yet? No, oh, sir. Tom Murphy, 10964 Hopper Square Park. Um, I'll tell you what I'm hearing so far. I'm hearing that the avid pickleball players want to make sure that they have uh, uh, proper facilities for playing. And I'm hearing the people near the uh, courts concerned about the noise. What I haven't heard so far is an objection from the avid pickleball players to noise abatement procedures as being a part of the plan. And given the mandate of the Resident Association to look out for the needs of all of the community residents, um, I'm interested in knowing uh, what we have to do to get the board to think in terms of changing the proposal so that that noise abatement could be included in this proposal. We do have multiple board members here, so they are definitely hearing you. Chris, would you be willing to give an example of what that noise abatement cost looks like just so that people understand what it is they're asking for? So we'll have to get back to the specifics of that. We just don't have enough detail on exactly what would work best in the implications of it because depending on options could have domino effects and other elements that have to be changed. Thank you. I appreciate that. Chris, I can answer that question for you and Margaret. <laughs> The average cost to put in sound proofing, not sound reflecting, is about $40,000 along the Harper Square side and closing both ends. And then you keep the Sunrise Valley portion of the courts open, one for, uh, to help our police, uh, uh, police the area for vandalism, which we've had at Barton Hill. And then, in consideration of the tennis players, if I'm a tennis player, it would drive me nuts to play tennis next door to pickleball. And so what you do is you put a sound barrier in the middle of the court, all the way down. Our concept was two courts and no shared use so that tennis would not be deprived of an opportunity. 
However, in the Barton Hill community, we recognize that we have pickleball players too. It's a growing sport. So two years ago, we proposed a compromise, which now has gone way beyond the pale, which will create a great deal of controversy and strife. And what we would hope is that we would not go to DRB and have to have another fight nor go beyond DOB, DRB, into court. <clears throat> Simply because you have 600 people, $55 million worth of property values that the Harper Square community and Barton Hill community are trying to protect. <clears throat> so for a simple amount of money, you must make sure that your fences are sturdy enough to handle. There are contractors out there galore, and I fed it to you for two years. Okay, some are good, some are bad. You have aesthetics, you have windproofing capability, you also have to look at the warranties. And all of that homework should have been done the last two years. All right, hasn't been done. Now you come in and you ask for six courts plus two shared courts, and you will turn our neighborhood into a zoo. And I'm, I think that Sound mitigation, to answer your question, is relatively inexpensive. And even though you may be in technical compliance with the Fairfax County Code, I can assure you that I live a half a mile away at the end of Barton Hill Court. I can assure you that I can hear pickleball. And so what we are trying to do is to strike a little balance and a reasonableness and and encourage an experiment, quite frankly, for other areas in Reston, because none of our courts were built for pickleball. They were built for casual use of the residents. Do not overuse the privilege of our facilities and adversely affect the property values that we have, because people will vote for their feet, never mind their litigation. So it's a simple thing for you guys to really work up the numbers and let us know before you lock everything into an RFP. Okay? There you go. I'll answer any questions. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very hard one to follow. Through. I mean, that's pretty much nailed it as far as all of us that live in the market report. I just wanted to back on a couple of comments. My next door neighbor, Rhonda Phillips. David Saunders. And I'm under part of the My next door neighbor and I are both in the same boat. We, we both face, in fact, our bedrooms and we face the court. I look out my window, I can see the court. Adjacent to the court, or across the street from the court, is a soccer field. And during the summer months, we, we typically can hear a lot of soccer activity. So from that same vantage point is what I'm saying, we, we know what the noise um, dissipation is in that area. Where that court is, I would expect to, to hear everything that goes on from my, from my bedroom. And like Rhonda, I work from home. So I wish I had his voice. Actually, I wouldn't need this. <laughs> You're Thank right. you. Go ahead. I hope anything I said was heard. Now I can hear it myself. Um, so basically, I'm just piggybacking on, on the general comments that we're hearing from people that live here. And I just wanted to add to it that we have enjoyed peace and quiet in this neighborhood. It's the reason I've lived there 18 years, um, work from home as well, knowing that you know, throughout the day I can hear a nut drop. And, and that may be a big difference from some of the other communities that have been able to absorb a kickle board, a kickle what are we talking about here? Pickleball <laughs> environment, uh, court, whatever. We are very quiet. If you added three squirrels to our trees, I would be able to tell you that. that that's, that's, the, that's the draw point. I think the gentleman here uh, mentioned that it would be nice to see a, a, a study done to measure the delta from where we are now to where we're going. So just keep that in mind. And my final comment is that, um, although we've touched on it, we don't have a plan for, for noise. Um, uh, abatement. 
Yes, that sort of thing. We may not have a plan going into this, but I would like to know what assurances we could be given that if there is a problem, that we can quickly address it. That's really what my, my question is. So in short order, if we have a problem, can we quickly say we've already talked about it, we made our best effort to, to with our measurement of decibels and such to, to go into this thinking we have a plan, but if we find out that the plan is not good enough, can we be assured that we will quickly act on that and deal with it? I think I'll just take a swing at, um, we don't have the, the process flow up, but we're gonna finish with that. I think one of the most important things about public input sessions is especially staff listening and understanding what the community concerns are. So the question of um, whether or not we exceed the county noise ordinance may not be the value question the community is asking us to consider. The question is incremental cost and the business part of RA and assessments and what where we should spend some money. So part of our job is to hear you all tonight and report back to the board and make the final financial decisions. So in terms of um, where we go from here to answer your question, the decision hasn't been fully made yet because we're in the scoping phase and we're hearing loud and clear that people would like to talk more about noise mitigation. So that's something we will certainly be reporting back and as Chris mentioned, taking a harder look at some of the numbers and appreciate Mr. Roundtree's comments about some preliminary costs and what they might be. Um, but to answer your question, we always want to think about being flexible going forward with any decision point. So, but for where we're at right now, it hasn't been scoped in because there was a foundational assumption that um, not exceeding the noise ordinance was a starting place. If that makes sense to everybody. Yeah. Which it doesn't. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Say one that first question to make sure. Hello, my, my name is Paul Garvey. I'm from uh, 10908 Wilder Point Lane, abutting the townhouses in that neighborhood. Uh, I have children in the neighborhood. I work from home. Uh, a lot of, lot of commonalities that have been shared with others here. Uh, I, I enjoy tennis as well. Uh, racquetball is fantastic, but I'm concerned about two things. One is the noise payment, and I would advocate for including that in the plan going into it rather than remedying it thereafter. As, as we've seen, these plans have been on the boards for the last 23 years, since 2000. I think that was in one of your first slides. Rather not wait for remedies to be introduced, rather see it in the original plan. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, this is a tertiary effect, but with added vehicular traffic, yes, it, it's the glare going, coming down Sunrise Valley that causes a lot of the accidents and hospitalizations and chopper medevacs. But more importantly, we have a lot of pedestrians who walk on that trail, and it is an RA trail. So the, the trail that is very close to the intersection if we can move that 20 feet further in on Wilder Point Lane, that would, that would give a lot more braking distance and a lot more safety for pedestrians, for runners, for cyclists who use the RA trail. And I, I would ask that that be considered as well. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, my name's Catherine Rupp. I live at 11044 Granby Court. Um, and just one thing that hasn't really been talked about tonight is during construction, and I don't have children, but I am very fond of all the children in my neighborhood, and they all walk to school. What is the plan during construction for all the children and parents who have to walk to school? And it just hasn't been brought up, and I was a little surprised by that. So I just wanted to mention that, what the action plan was for those sidewalks that will be blocked by construction materials. So to that point, uh, we'll be utilizing the existing parking lot as well as potentially the soccer field side parking lot for the stage and equipment storage. There would be signage and security fencing that would help delineate and separate pedestrian traffic from materials and equipment. 
Um, once the machinery is really kind of on the court area, there's not going to be necessarily a lot of movement in and out at that point since they're kind of on there and they'll just shuffle themselves about within the facility as they work. Um, you know, we did the same project over at Hook Road. There's a lot of pedestrian traffic around that area as well, and we were able to, to find an amicable solution with them when, uh, in that area. So I think we could do the same over at uh, Art Hill. Hi, my name is Carol Dickey, and I live at 1552 Trails Edge Lane, uh, which is very close to the Autumnwood facility. And I would just like to reassure people that uh, I'm a pickleball player, by the way, but we do not find the noise offensive or difficult to deal with at all. When you're in the front of our house, you don't hear it. And I would say that the noise coming from swim team in the mornings <laughs> is significantly louder than pickleball, as is the Dulles air traffic and uh, Fairfax County Parkway. Uh, and I would also say that there's really, we have an abundant amount of wildlife in our neighborhood and backyard. And the deer, the birds, the foxes do not seem, squirrels, they do not seem to, to mind them at all. I just wanted to comment Laura David from Harper Square Court. We have an opportunity here. I, I tend to be an optimist. We have an opportunity. I see if pickleball is going to be more popular and yet we have tennis players and we have a balanced community, we have an opportunity to do this right and to do the best job we can. And I would urge the board to commit the personnel in scheduling, to find a scheduling program that is approachable and usable to schedule tennis or schedule pickleball or keep them in proportion and to then be data driven and my profession we're very data driven it, it's great to have uh, anecdotes about this worked and that worked and it didn't but to look at who's using it how often what times of the day and I'm sorry if you don't have a lot of personnel but I would encourage you to get more because if we're going to move from this Barton Hill to another place to another place or think about an indoor facility, we need data, and we need to really try to do the best job the first time so we don't have any regrets. So my encouragement is to find whatever personnel, whatever schedule program on the computer, whatever you need to get this right so that you can use it well to lead you to the next step and the next step and the next step, which is sure to come. In the last 10 minutes, we'll probably take you one or two more questions so we can kind of wrap up for the remaining slides there. So, yeah. Austin, I think you might have. Yeah, he he okay. raised his yeah. hand. Yeah. All right. Hi, John Betchy, well on 935 Escalante Court. Um, I'm an old, old tennis player, about 50 years, and I switched to pickleball recently, and it's great. But I tell you what, scheduling is a nightmare. It doesn't matter what you do, but it's a nightmare. that causes lots and lots of problems. Much easier to have separate facilities, I think. If we could get all wood and just be all pickleball, it'd be great. A couple of people I fight with live in the neighborhood right there, don't have a problem. And I also appreciate the noise abatement issue. So I'm happy to have more pickleball courts, but make you guys happy and doesn't seem like a very big cost. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Julie Shonman, I'm at 2517 Soapstone Drive in South Ruston, and I am a budding pickleball player. Um, and it's really, I was so excited to find out that we might have something in South Ruston, because going across Ruston to play in North Ruston, and then as you're a single solo player, you show up, you can't even get on a court. It's, it's like really hard to get into a game. And so I, I was just so excited to have something on South Ruston, so I've heard a couple of suggestions, oh, just put it up at North Point or keep it all at Autumnwood, it's, you know, constrained at Autumnwood. And from my point of view, that would really be a step back. So, thank you. This is a suggestion. Um, right now, what I saw is a proposal for building, but I didn't see anything for scaling and for growth and for programming. I'm a lifetime member. I know lifetime, the pickleball, director has been 
biting at this chance to do a league with RA, and I know those people are fanatical. I've tried pickleball, and I just know the excitement's going to be huge, and I can't express this enough. This has to be so thoughtful because the foot traffic will be huge, and it's going to, depending on the hours, it's going to impact school hours and the walkers. That's all I'm going to say. So I would really encourage you to present a plan that not only addresses everyone else's concern about sound, but also a five-year growth plan of how you're going to maintain the facility and how you're going to maintain the foot traffic that's going to come from a league program because it's going to be bananas, which is great for pickleball players, but then I also want to know how that's going to be addressed for our community. All right, probably the last question. Okay, so I also was not planning on being the last person to speak and I'm foot stomping the gentleman who was in the front earlier because I'm a little nervous about this too, but I'm just gonna like give you all my story and take you on my journey with me. I'm Megan Murphy, I'm at 10900 Harper Square Court and I am in one of the houses whose back deck looks right out on over the tennis courts. I am a full-time working mom with a full-time working husband. I have two children, a five-year-old and an 18-month-old and our five-year-old is a special needs kid. And as part of what she is going through, one of the beautiful benefits that we have of the community that we actively moved from Roslyn, which had the high rises and had the metro and had all of these great, busy, active communities in it. One of the reasons we moved from there out to Reston was to back ourselves up against this beautiful ravine and to allow some of that nature to be a part of our lives after stressful days at work and after stressful days at school and to raise our kids in a place where they could be part of that. For me, when I think about having to do something like put noise-canceling headphones on my child so that she can listen to Zen Garden while she's walking around outside rather than hearing the noise that we know comes from pickleball, it's terrifying to me. I know for the people who are on the board, I know it's easy to look at me and just say you are one household, you have one interesting, exceptional case, but I can guarantee you if you talk to the people in the community here, Every single house has their own reasons for being concerned and every single house has their own um, exceptions to why they are nervous about this. Like, I'm so excited for all of the pickleball players that you have found your passion, that you found your love, that you've got something that's getting you out there and active and social, but I think we need to be really careful and I'll just foot stamp all of the concerns that people have expressed and offer, again, my emphasis on the board, really taking a close look at the noise mitigation in particular at the foot traffic, at the parking, I mean, everyone's kind of giving you a litany of things that still need to be worked out here. Because at the end of the day, we are looking to you to protect us too. And I know you have to give to the pickleball players, and I know they are a robust, numerous, and a very active community. Um, and if, that, if it is the case that we know that people aren't really gonna be there at 7 a.m., then maybe some of those measures include saying, okay, on Saturdays and Sundays, pickleball won't start until like nine or 10. If those are easy gives, maybe there are other measures that we can be looking into to kind of all bring us to a good place on this because I think we all understand that you guys have to serve the pickleball community and have put together a good proposal and have put a lot of work into doing that, but we're also looking to you to protect us as residents of this area. And, and there have been a lot of suggestions and a lot of steps that can be taken to serve both of these communities. I live at 1936 Parking Hill Road. Um, I've been listening to all of this, not just tonight, but for years. Um, I'm not going to take sides at this point, on one, two, or the other, because there are several competing views here. I just want to say, in all honesty, that after years of proposals, years of meetings, years of discussion, when every one of these concerns have been raised many times, I am appalled 
that the board can present another proposal, one more proposal that still doesn't even address these concerns. To me, they are, seem to be completely ignored, and I'm hoping they can tell me I'm wrong uh, by how you decide. So just a couple of quick slides, and then we're, we're basically right at 8 o'clock and we're here for wrapping this up. Um, so for the next steps, so all the input information, suggestions, ideas, we're going to take that inputs, we're going to look at them, evaluate them, we're going to integrate them if we, if we can, um, and then we'll be going before the design review board before we'd ever get to construction to then go through that process. So there'll be another opportunity as part of that process. Um, so we'll be posting the DRB application. Uh, to the RA webpage, the project page, you can see the link here. Uh, also, have the, have the web address there, and then the green buttons where the access uh, important documents will be. So once we have the um, application filed, there will be notices sent out to the community. I hope you guys got a lot of postcards. I sent out about 700 of them about this meeting. So pretty much be the same groupage of people getting uh, notifications about the DRB application when it's filed. It'll tell you. Uh, the details of the project, what's for them to be reviewed, the date of the meeting, and how you can register as an affected party on the project. Um, the contact information is there regarding who you'd be contacting once we file the application. Um, and then following that review period, uh, you know, if it's approved, it'll be another 10 days to then finalize the approval, then we'd be moving on through the process. So just kind of circling back on the project life cycle, as I mentioned. So right now we're looking to get the KDP-1, so this one right here, cleared by the board in May. So we'll be gathering those input, we'll kind of develop the final scope of work for their consideration and integration into the next phase, which is the design architecture engineering. There's not going to be necessarily a lot of engineering architecture, because what we're doing is more maintenance work in terms of the county perspective, so there's no actual building permits required. We're just rebuilding existing. We're not disturbing areas beyond 2,500 square feet. Um, so that phase is going to move pretty quick because there's not a lot to do there. Um, we'll really be kind of working through the DRB application process. So once we have that finalized and approved, then we'll be going to the board at KDP2 uh, to then move into the estimation procurement. That's when we we'll release RFPs. We'll start getting bids back on the work and we'll be finalizing the project estimate. And then at KDP3, they'd be actually approving a contract with a builder and then at that point, we'll be starting the work. Uh, we'll be sure to be presenting a lot of inputs and updates uh, about the project as we go along. Um, you know, like I said earlier, we're expecting somewhere between a five and a six and a half month construction timeline. Um, that could extend into 2024. It just depends on how we get through all these other cycles. If we hit winter months during key parts of the project, like color coding, which is painting, very sensitive temperature and weather, that may have to wait until the following spring, perhaps. So for future updates, so here's your contact information. You can reach the tennis project page for this picture of major project. Uh, if you have interest, there's also other major projects that are ongoing you can get interest, uh, information on, like Throw, Shadowwood. Um, the capital project's email address, so that goes to my department. We'll make sure we get back to all your questions. If you have any following the meeting, there's also the capital hotline, or you can leave a message. We'll make sure we get back to you if you want to do that way. Um, with that, uh, that concludes the meeting. Um, Can I just ask a quick question? Sure. Do I, am, I, am I hearing that you're going to have a DRB meeting before the May board meeting? No. So we would get the clearance from the board first at KDP-1, which is basically what we're going to go in for application, and then we go through that process, and once that's approved, then you go to the next key decision point. So we'll be... We have to go to the board first on a finalized scope before we actually file for the application. And your, and your plan is to do that in May? We'll plan to go to the board in May, and then once we have that decision, then we'll be executing the application at that point. So the, board, the board will have an opportunity to react. Absolutely. Will yeah. you release that draft scope and present it to the board publicly? It will be part of, it would be included within the board packet that's part of their agenda items for that meeting. So in May, the board pack is released, which have all the presentations and materials of the topics that will be discussed, and this would be one of them. And that's available on the RA website. And I can also uh, include a copy of that within the work documents of the project page. Yeah, if we have it, if we have it done earlier, we can put it up on the you know, release it earlier, and you know, we can talk to the board about that. 
Because I'm obviously there's a lot of interest in it. So we would have plenty of people's feedback on that. And definitely, if you haven't signed in earlier, make sure you do so. We'll put on a listserv, and so we have direct contact to you to then push any information that we have as it comes in. Is there any flexibility? Why should they make because in April, there isn't actually a board meeting held because it's the elections. So not when really business is conducted. So the next opportunity would be May. And we need time to integrate all this input to then finalize for board presentations. Interesting, interesting that there's an election where we need to influence other board members with our opinions, their new ones, and you're doing it right after an election to make a major decision on a community product. Like, why not push it back one month later to allow us to interact? The new board members are going to be in this room. If they are. You mean to June? Sure. I just don't understand why we're doing it in May. What's the rush? By doing it in May, it gives us enough time to perhaps get the project completed within this year. If we push it any later than that, we're likely going to hit that winter break, which means the project would have to carry forward into 2024. So it's really an expense to try to get the project completed in the year that it's funded to avoid carrying forward. Now that could be pushed to June if the board decides they need more time to deliberate, especially as the new board is seated, that is definitely something they could choose to do. But timing wise, it worked out that May was the next opportunity to do so. I, I, I would encourage you to explore pushing that timeline back because having new members and not having some of those folks here present, to me doesn't seem fair. So this presentation will also be uploaded and made available publicly. So they'll have a recording of this and anyone can view it as well. So we'll have that. Okay. Again, appreciate you guys coming. It was a great turnout. Happy to see so many faces here. Again, contact with the information.